Like many of you, I'm sure, my thoughts recently have been around the, the many changes that we're experiencing. And then just processing for myself, for my family, and for people around me, what this means in terms of our confidence. And you can't help but think of a passage like this. I'd like to ask you to look at it with me. Matthew 7, 24, Every then, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains fell, the floods came, the winds blew, it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And you know the rest of this, the foolish man built his house on the sand. So when the storm comes, his house falls. Just one comment about that on our way to another thought and another idea. The basic notion here I think goes, you could appear to be okay in times of ease and times of security. You could look at two houses side by side, if we imagine it that way, and, and they both look quite okay. The only time you know that one of those houses has a weak foundation is when trouble comes. And the reality then is that for many people and some believers, the time of trouble or insecurity or fear right now is a time when we're going to discover whether our faith really was founded upon a rock or whether we were trusting in something much weaker. Is our faith and our theology thick enough, rich enough, and yes, secure enough that times of trouble do not have to change it? We don't have to seek for a new truth. Our God has not been broken because of what has happened to us. A couple of passages that then take us further in this direction. And here's how I plan to spend a couple of moments with you today. I want us to consider the pattern across scripture of God as our rock. I, I've heard that language a lot during this difficult time. People talking and returning in their minds. God is our rock. God is our security. Which is a wonderful comfort. It's just... it. It made me start to process, what does it mean that God is our rock? What is the intention of that language? And what is the confidence that we have because of it? So I started looking, and the first set of passages I found, and quite a number of passages at that, were passages that discuss God across the Old Testament as our rock. Let's say God the Father or even just in terms of God without even speaking of the Trinity at all. Language like this, uh, Deuteronomy 32, 4, he is the rock. His work is perfect. He's a God that is faithful. Or Deuteronomy 32, 13, he talks about how he actually gave them food out of the rock. And so then they turned in verse 15 and they scoffed at their rock. They were not mindful of their rock that bore them. And actually then later when God judged them because they fled before their enemies, it was their rock, God, who allowed this to happen. In fact, their enemies, verse 31, have their own gods, they have their own faith, but their rock is not like our rock. And you could just keep on going with this. Beautiful Psalms like Psalm 18, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Who is God but the Lord? Who is a rock except our God? The Lord lives and blessed be my rock. Let us come sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. All of these passages richly and beautifully are describing the reality that God is our security and our confidence at such times. If I was going to summarize those passages quite simply, um, I would come up with these three ideas that we could talk about. God is our rock means salvation. God is our rock and our salvation as one passage describes it. God is our safety. He's a fortress. Some of these passages in the Old Testament actually parallel. He is the rock. He is our fortress. And there is also a, a concept of exclusivity. And what I mean is he alone is the rock. Their rock is not like our rock. He's exclusively so. Okay, but follow out the logic here because it, it actually gets a little bit more complicated. God is our rock. I said that if you thinking in terms of the Old Testament. But I come into the New Testament and I discover a new set of patterns and it's that Jesus is the rock. Now, let me explain one or two notions here first. 
when I say Jesus is the rock, I mean exactly that. I, I would like to put that word the in all caps. Jesus is the rock. As in, if we had any other faith in any other kind of salvation, no, Jesus is the one and only, the exclusive. He stands apart. He's the only one like this. And when you go with that notion, then you discover an entire, I would call it an entire web of ideas, a huge number of passages that come together and together are giving this, this rich tapestry explaining and understanding Jesus is our rock. So let me show you that. I'm going to show you a diagram now that will be a little bit, whoa, overwhelming, but we'll understand it a little by little. Here on this side of the diagram, you see Old Testament passages. So all of these passages, Isaiah, Psalms, Daniel, and on the other side of the screen, you see New Testament passages. So here you see 1 Peter and Romans and Matthew. And so the two sides, Old Testament, New Testament, are connected by this web of lines you have going everywhere in every direction. Again, I know it's a little visually overwhelming. What I plan to do here is just to show you as we go down this side, the Old Testament side, how some of these things are connected. And then what I want to invite you to do is take a little time and see how these New Testament passages that quote the Old Testament passages develop the thought. So everywhere where you see these colors here, these are New Testament passages that quote, for instance, Isaiah 8. And if you go back and you look at Isaiah 8 and then you study these passages, you discover the New Testament has taken all of this and it's applied it to Jesus now. Well, let's look at it. Let's zoom in here first and let's look at Isaiah 8. And it just says he will become a sanctuary. There's our idea again of a fortress, a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel. So it sounds like he is the stone, but like a stumbling stone, like a rock on the path. And you're going along and you hit this rock and you trip. Why? What's it talking about? Well, just two things I'll quickly say in Isaiah. One, this in context, Isaiah 8, is talking about Yahweh, Jehovah. And so it's very interesting. The stumbling stone is Jehovah. Okay, but there's more to the story. Because this is Isaiah 8. Do you remember Isaiah 7, 14? The virgin will conceive and she will bear a son and he will be called Emmanuel, God with us. And actually, again, here in chapter 8, verse 8, the language Emmanuel comes up again. And so you're getting all the way back in the Old Testament. Wait a minute. This is God, Jehovah, but it's also God with us, Emmanuel. And take that and bring it forward into the New Testament with these passages that tell us this is Jesus. And what's really striking is Isaiah 8 is telling you Jesus is God. There's more. When you go to this passage, you see that people were placing their faith in context. They were placing their faith in these two other kings to deliver them. So they were in trouble. Let's say it was a time of crisis very parallel to our own time. And so then the notion goes, what will we do? What's our solution? And they could place their trust in these two kings, Rezin and Remaliah, in our own case. We could place our trust in the hope that they'll come up with a vaccine. They place their faith in that, and God says, no, I'm going to destroy your faith. You're going to be judged if you place your faith in anything else besides me. You will stumble, and I am the reason <laughs> you will stumble on the stumbling stone. And when we come to the New Testament, Jesus is the reason that such people will be judged. So one application we could make here, place your faith only in the rock that can be trusted in. Which actually takes us to the next passage, Isaiah 28. I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, and whoever believes in him will not be ashamed. The context here in, in Isaiah 28, the wicked people of Israel take pride in their drunkenness and in their immorality. It's kind of a nothing can stop me. I can drink two kegs of beer and I'm not still not drunk kind of pride. There's no moral foundation left. Everything has been destroyed. And God's answer to that is I set my own foundation and the moral foundation I will set is a cornerstone. 
It's the picture, everything has been turned to rubble, but then God steps forward and he sets his new standard. Here's the dividing line, here's the cornerstone, this is right, this is wrong, I have set out a new standard of righteousness, and now you will know what is right and wrong. I will establish true justice, and the standard of that justice is my cornerstone, and your boasting will be put to shame. Now you go forward into the New Testament, And you find these three passages all identifying Jesus as that cornerstone. Jesus sets the standard for morality and justice. The last piece of the phrase in that passage, whoever believes will not be ashamed, by the way, is just a hint. How will you find salvation in Jesus? Faith, Paul argues in Romans 9, by believing in him, you will not be ashamed. You will not be set aside. Two more Old Testament passages, Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And in context in Psalm 18, you find that a righteous person is mocked and they're surrounded by wicked people. And these wicked people, like bees, it says, coming, buzzing around, constantly persecuting or surrounded by all the nations. And so the result of this is that the people in charge, the builders, it calls them, have rejected him. Imagine builders, they're going through the stones, they pick up this stone, okay, we can use this one, no, this one's worthless, and they're sorting the stones out. And so they pick up the one, no, useless, throw it. And the psalm says, no, actually, the stone you rejected is the most important one at all. of all. The stone you rejected is the cornerstone. And then when Jesus now quotes that, he speaks it, Matthew 21, Mark, Luke, he speaks that to the religious leaders of his day. And he says to them, you have rejected the cornerstone, and that cornerstone is me. The stone that the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. The one you said was useless is the most important of all, and it's me, and I define the truth. The last passage, Daniel chapter 2. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left to another people. And so how it is destroyed, a stone cut from a mountain by no human hand comes, and it crushes the image. Remember Nebuchadnezzar's image, the stone and the bronze and the clay, the silver and the, the gold. That stone crushes them all. The simple notion of this is that the kingdom of God, or even more specifically, Jesus the king, will come. And all the kingdoms of the earth will fall before Jesus, the eternal king. It's a beautiful picture. Now, all of that is just maybe a lot, maybe too much information, a lot of content in there. I'm not so much trying to cover all of those passages as more, I want to invite you, consider taking a look at these passages and their richness and the wealth of what God has given us here, and just be in awe. at the richness of what God shows us. Or if we follow at that pattern here, I summarized it and the three basic ideas that you find from those passages. Jesus Christ is the stumbling stone, meaning the wicked will reject him, but the righteous will accept him. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. He establishes true justice. He tells you the standards of right and wrong. And even like a mountain coming in and crushing the kingdoms of the earth, Jesus comes and he sets all of the kingdoms aside and in its place, his kingdom with him as the king reigning for all eternity. This is the richness of this. And just as I said before, a comment, just to notice that we move from God is our rock to Jesus is our rock. What's going on here? Well, there's one last layer. And the last layer is that believers are living stones. Believers, Christians, are stones in a building that God is building. And let me show you what that looks like. It's just from one passage. Again, I would invite you to, in your own time, take some time and look at this passage. It's beautiful. 1 Peter 2. And you can see here the passages that we've just considered. It stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious. Or the honor is for you who believe, those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, or a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. These are three of the four passages we just looked at. They're right here. So this passage is richly intertwined in all of these other passages that we've already considered together. It's one among the many that we've been considering. Okay, but now watch where it comes from in the flow of logic. 
Because just before, watch this, as you come to him, Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, that's the passage we were just looking at, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, verse 5, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Do you follow the logic of this? The logic goes, God is our rock. Jesus is the rock. But we, we, the followers of Jesus, united with him, it's a union with Christ notion. We are also living stones in this great temple that God is building. And to summarize this, four concepts that come out, union with Christ, he is the rock. We are now living stones united with him. Another concept, our foundation is resting in our faith. Who believes on him will not be ashamed. We already saw that. Third, suffering holds no fear. Jesus was rejected, cast aside, yet God has exalted him. So we, if we're rejected, why should we fear? Jesus also suffered those things. We are united with him. And then finally, richly, we are stones in God's temple. He is the rock. We ourselves now are living stones, united with him, connected with him, just as he is. So I'm going to give you two applications here. And the first application just goes like this. As we are in this time of a lot of uncertainty and questions and, and fear, it's, it's easy to say, well, God is our rock. And just claim that. I would like to say this more specifically. God is your rock insofar as you are actually connected, united with him and built on the foundation. In other words, uh, my basic idea is not everybody gets to say God is their rock. Or to use Jesus' words, the one who hears these words of mine and does them, his life is founded on a rock. And many people will claim that God is their rock, and he is not. And in this time then of uncertainty, I would invite you to have certainty. But I would invite you to have certainty by one way and one way alone. That is... You build your life on the foundation and the truth of God's words in relationship with him, Jesus Christ as your savior, so that you can truly claim that no matter what comes or whatever happens, Jesus is your rock, not just words, but a reality. He is your rock if you build your life on the truth of who he is. And then a richer piece that comes from that I said that we are living stones built on the foundation. So the notion goes that God is building, Peter's language, a temple, a place of dwelling, that we dwell together with God. Jesus is the foundation of that temple. He is the rock. He's the cornerstone. We are living stones built upon that foundation. So our life is secure as long as we are truly built upon him and his words and obedience to him. But then we're living stones within this temple. And that means that if I'm a stone, I'm, I'm connected to many others. We're, we're part of one great work that God is doing. And we, we all serve and function together in different roles within that one building. You and I have time and opportunity right now, though limited by distance. But you can still call people. You can still message people. I would encourage you, use this time to truly build up the other living stones. This is an opportunity, an opportunity to serve and to love your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't go through this time alone. Don't, don't be isolated, but truly try to build up the other ones around you. God is our rock. Jesus is the rock. And if you're built on this foundation, if Jesus is your foundation, you're just one stone among many in the beautiful thing that God is doing. Play your part well. Do what he has called you to do for his honor and his glory because he has a purpose in all of this for you. Let's accomplish and live out that purpose well.